Okay, so this is the uh, pre-lecture on uh, disease and conservation. And, uh, well, we'll just see how it goes. So it's likely to take a bit more than 15 minutes uh, once again. <clears throat> so uh, first thing I'm going to do is give a, just a, a really brief uh, introduction to epidemiology and this idea of, of understanding how disease is spread and then link it into conservation studies that have thought about this with respect to conservation targets. And so uh, one of the first instances where people thought about the spread of disease uh, happened in 1854. It's called the Broad Street Cholera Epidemic. And this little picture down the lower left is actually the water pump that's memorialized now. But what was happening was that cholera, uh, which was thought to be caused by bad air, uh, was spreading rapidly in London. In one week, 600 people near the Broad Street uh, died. And a fellow named John Snow started uh, tracing the pathways of people and began to realize that it was all people walking by a particular water pump. And this uh, main picture here is a cartoon of uh, death pumping the water out. And, uh, and so he recommended that the uh, pump be uh, closed and then the uh, epidemic ceased. So people came to know uh, more about disease as a consequence of, of uh, his actions. But uh, we have had, uh, you know, now 100 years of, or 150 years of studying diseases, and a lot of diseases uh, run in epidemics, uh, periodic epidemics like this. So this graph here simply shows, um, uh, uh, I guess it's influenza or measles in London in the 1900s, and how it would uh, crop up three or four to five times uh, a, a decade, about every other year, and have big outbreaks. Well, antibiotics and vaccinations uh, by the 1970s uh, tamped that way down, but uh, the question was why do you get this sort of periodic uh, uh, pattern to these epidemics? And so uh, epidemiologists often talk about uh, something called the SIRS, SIR model, and that's what's uh, di di uh, um, sorry, depicted in this uh, set of cartoons where uh, the arrow from the left is you have birth and immigration and, and things entering a population uh, and that uh, individuals in the population are, are susceptible and that then by contact and uh, this, this factor B, the probability of contact times the probability of transmission, susceptible individuals can be infected. Infected individuals can either die and leave the population or uh, become recovered. And uh, so the graph, the, 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 the graph on the lower right uh, suggests what would happen in a SERS model through time. And you see that you have a large susceptible population. And as the epidemic uh, is, uh, breaks out, that susceptible population goes down as they become infected. And you can see the green population, which is the infected population. So here's the, the peak of that outbreak. It peaks, but then it drops again because what, there's, what you're left with is... Uh, is recovered individuals in the population, and so they then carry some um, resistance to reinfection. And so it takes a while before you build up susceptible uh, a susceptible population again. And this is how you can get these uh, periodic peaks. And you can see this in a variety of cases. Here's one. Uh, this is a paper from Nature in 2005, and it compares uh, syphilis and gonorrhea. So syphilis is on the left. And you look at the peaks, and this is in four cities, New York, Rochester, Houston, Birmingham. And you can see that uh, there's uh, a peakiness to the data in the number of cases through time. Uh, spectral analysis uh, to the right shows that there is a, a peak period at about a decade. Gonorrhea, on the other hand, doesn't have the same kind of periodicity. Well, one wonders why that is. They're both sexually transmitted diseases. Well, the difference is, is that uh, that... Uh, syphilis either kills you or you end up with a protective immune response uh, through after your uh, cured of syphilis, and that uh, recontact has a lot reduced likelihood of of transmission. Transmission. There's also been other uh, arguments that when you have a, a, a syphilis outbreak, that people change behaviors, and that that change in behavior lasts for a while, and then memory fades, and people. Uh, go back to risky behaviors, whereas gonorrhea, which is a much easy, more easily curable thing, has and also has no protective immune response, and so that you can uh, change, um, so that pe uh, that the levels of, of disease are about the same. So this uh, this anyway, this uh, SIRS model works uh, in some instances of of diseases to to humans and and presumably also to wildlife, and of course then there's um, 
other things that are involved. We live in a, a global world now, and uh, this is Malcolm Gladwell up on the right uh, talking about uh, highly connected people and suggesting that some people are considerably more connected uh, than others. And this is in the bottom is a six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon, uh, a game of you know how you connect to Kevin Bacon. And you realize that uh, that the world is variably connected, both in terms of people and, and how much people move and and how um, an individual, how many people they come in contact with, but also with respect to wealth. And so this diagram on the left uh, is a diagram out of the Economist just this week about the Zika virus, and uh, the red shaded areas represent uh, the length of time or that. Uh, areas would be susceptible to the uh, mosquito that carries the Zika virus uh, and uh, an Aedes mosquito, and, and they uh, live in warm, tropical, moist areas. And so the southeastern United States, particularly down in Florida, the tropical parts of uh, Mexico, wet parts of Mexico, uh, most susceptible, a little bit of susceptibility elsewhere, and a lot of susceptibility in, uh, in South America. And then those blue bubbles in there represent how many people are, are visiting uh, 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 Brazil and where they're from. And so you see that the United States is a considerably more uh, connected to Brazil than, than some of these other countries. And so it's, it behooves us, I think, to think about these um, uh, connections and the networks that are created among people and, and thinking about how disease uh, is transmitted. So we'll come back to that uh, if, with one of our examples later. And just to sort of hammer that home, uh, in terms of, of conservation and organisms, uh, we are a very, very connected uh, country. Um, this is from a, uh, a paper that was looking at CITES uh, flux of species, and mostly amphibians. Or I think it was actually amphibians and reptiles. And it was showing that the vast majority of Southeast Asian uh, amphibians and reptiles are, are being transported to the U.S., Canada, and, and Europe that we're well connected uh, with terms of species moving around. This is a thing that came out in Science Daily just this week where it's showing uh, the nitrogen uh, international trade routes and intensity. And again, um, if you want to stop and scrutinize the numbers here, you see that the United States has a lot of nitrogen moving in and out. We also have it's just a massive, uh, you know, a continual increase in the number of different invasive species that uh, are, are entering this country. Uh, all the time, and some of these, many of these pests uh, are are well out of uh, control, but and, and are causing an are outbreaking in uh, much like a, an epidemiological model would suggest. The Asian longhorn beetle, gypsy moths, emerald ash borer; these things are all things that are have, are, have, are running a disease epidemic like pattern across the U.S. And of course, our, one of our early examples of this is uh, is a, the American chestnut. The map on the left shows uh, the historic range of American chestnut, and you can see the tiny people against these huge trees in the southeast, which is the way the chestnut used to look. The chestnut now uh, uh, can live about long enough to make a few chestnuts, and so you get seedlings. Uh, by the time they get a few inches in diameter, they begin to get these cankers, and long before they get to be those large majestic trees, they, the cankers uh, girdle the trees and, and they die. And this uh, has really fundamentally changed the nature of the eastern ecosystems by changing the species composition. Uh, we have other examples uh, of this is a, a, a graph just showing gypsy moth spread and, and, and looking like a front uh, moving through, through the country, uh, again, changing ecosystems. And so we think of these as invasive species problems, but we can also think of them very much like a disease epidemic in terms of their behaviors and their spread. And now the one that one of our groups is working on and that we'll be, you know, of course, hearing more about through the quarter is sudden oak death and this idea that these Phytophthora are uh, uh, pathogens that uh, broadly infect a lot of different species but have um, uh, severe adverse impacts on only a few. And so this has been one of the challenges of Phytophthora remora is that it's found in, in very many different host plants but only uh, really causes uh, uh, like sudden oak death and things like this in just a, a few species. And it was a horticultural uh, introduction. There are a lot of Phytophthora around the world and most of them were horticulturally spread and uh, are causing problems in uh, various different 
uh, species of plants. So another one of the cases uh, where we can think about uh, disease ecology and uh, conservation where it has a human impact is with uh, Lyme disease. And so uh, the graph on the lower right is uh, showing the increase in Lyme disease from the late, you know, through the 90s and into the 2000s. And this is a thing, if you're from the Northeast, you probably are well familiar with, or the, North, or the Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, that there's a lot higher incidence of Lyme disease in the East uh, than in the West. But it's a tick-borne disease uh, bacteria that causes, uh, often in about 60% of cases, causes this bullseye rash, uh, but in about a third of cases doesn't. And so it's a difficult thing to uh, detect, but it, if let go, um, you know, the, the um, early symptoms are often like a little bit of flu, but if let uh, run, it can result in chronic arthritis and neural damage and, and th you know, consequences that people uh, can, you know, may not ever recover from fully. And so it has a complex lifestyle where um, uh, the larval ticks um, uh, infect mice and birds and sometimes small reptiles and that these nymphs will then drop off of their first host. Uh, you can see this life cycle with the blue arrows down in the bottom. And will uh, and those nymphs then will uh, infect a larger mammal host, in, including um, uh, humans. And that uh, then they will uh, grow and mature on uh, and deposit uh, bacteria. If they're carrying those bacteria, drop off, lay eggs, and the cycle uh, uh, continues. And this is a... Um, a story that was put together by Rick Osfeld and Felicia Keesing and others who did a lot of really care careful study looking at how uh, forest composition related to uh, likelihood of disease incidence. And one of the things we know about oaks is that they have mass years, and so there's years where there's massive reproduction, and other years where there's there's very little reproduction, and it, it fluctuates back and forth. And what happens then is both uh, uh, two really good hosts, both the white-footed mice and the deer uh, respond to these acorns. They do much better, and they aggregate in areas where there are uh, mice and, or sorry, where there are acorns. And this facilitates the transmission of uh, small ticks, larval ticks, into uh, nymphs on the, on the larger mammals. And that this then increases the likelihood of disease transmission and the likelihood of human encounter. And so we end up getting uh, these um, high incidence of, of uh, Lyme disease. And this. The argument has been that there um, that this has been increasing for at least two reasons. One of which is a simplification of forests, and so you get um, uh, areas you know oaks are at higher density than they were in the past, and as a consequence, you have more acorns in particular patches. But also, there's been this huge recovery of uh, white-tailed deer in the eastern United States, and so deer are much more frequent, and so it's it's created. Uh, an increased probability of disease transmission because of probability and contact and transmission. So there's more my uh, ticks around that um, can spread the bacteria. Well, this story was funded at least in part by this National Science Foundation program on the ecology of infectious diseases, and it's been a uh, process, uh, you know, a, a grant program where uh, NSF and NIH have joined together to say, oh, this is, you know, really important uh, stuff to try and figure out. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wave that has been moving through many fields. So, for example, in the early 1990s when I was at Illinois, the veterinary school in, at the University of Illinois uh, was moving to uh, create an eco-doc program where they wanted to have doctoral, or sorry, veterinary students uh, who were interested in, in wildlife diseases uh, trained in ecology so that they could be better uh, epidemiologists. And we certainly have a, a fairly uh, robust uh, group of people like that here on campus at, at our vet school as well. There's a lot of people who are trained to be vets who are really you know, less interested in cats and dogs or house, horses and cows and more interested uh, in wildlife. So I'm going to uh, stop this one here and then I'll uh, finish it in looks like maybe five minutes or so on another um,